Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. Mark Newman of La Crosse is a Democrat running in the 3rd Congressional District. The primary is August 11. Mark, thanks so much for talking to Wisconsin Eye. I'm happy to be here, Steve. Thank you. You're a first-time candidate, so I'm just curious. Uh, what one or two issues led you to get into this race, sir? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but uh, if you're asking for the issues, the first one would be Medicare for All is a need that we uh, need to solve our cruel health care financing system. Uh, I'm a physician, retired a year ago last February, and so I had a front row seat at how our healthcare financing is very difficult for people, and as I use the word cruel, uh, particularly I was a pediatrician, and I could see how a family with a distressed, you know, very distressed about a sick child or a very injured child, worrying about how we pay for this, and a father who would be willing to sell the farm for the sake of saving his daughter's life. And it's something that we should not tolerate in our country. Other economies as advanced as ours have solved this issue and we keep being stuck with it. So I call it uh, the need for a single payer, universal, comprehensive national health insurance, which is the fancy name for Medicare for all. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's something like what Canada has. And we have legislation in the Congress right now, HR 1384 is a fine piece of legislation with about 120 co-signers uh, and it needs to go forward. My congressman uh, is not a co-signer and so I would, if I would take his place, I would sign that bill as soon as I was eligible. Well, uh, or I sign on as a uh, sign on that bill. I should sign say. on as a sponsor. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when he was still a candidate, um, Bernie Sanders talked about this plan and people threw up the price tag of it as just uh, one reason not to enact it. So can you, uh, d d do you trust the price estimates that came out when Mr. Sanders was campaigning? It just sounded like a hideous amount of money. Was it overstated? Well, it was misstated, put it that way. We have a uh, attitude in the payment of our health care that it's uh, commoditized. It's something that people can buy if they um, are able to if they have the finances. But I see health care as being a communal um, obligation or communal engagement. In other words, nobody gets sick alone. When any of us get sick, everyone else you know, in our circle experiences that, suffers with us to some degree. If it's our family, we suffer more. And if it's uh, when we think about, well, how do we stay healthy? We can only do it together. You, human beings remain healthy when they are living in a healthy community. And so it really is a communal effort. But if we look at healthcare financing as being just a commodity that can be bought and sold if you have the need, we're on the wrong page. We have the wrong frame. But that's the one that allows us to talk about high prices and it's impossible to pay because um, um, when we think about it, the communal effort we're already paying for two thirds of our health care right now from public funding. Uh, when I learned that about two years ago, I was flabbergasted. I didn't realize that two thirds of our $3.7 trillion that we spend on the healthcare care industry is already coming from public funding. Why are we not getting a better return on, on our investment? It's because we allow too many um, profiteers in the system, too many people making money off of this commoditized attitude we need to recognize that that doesn't work. And it actually makes it much more difficult for the doctors and therapists and nurses to do their job. And it makes it very uncomfortable for us as individuals. So, but because these interests that are making money off of the system as it is, are very powerful. They're powerful in Washington, DC. They know how to do social engineering. They know how to market their, their position or distort the conversation so that we end up having a really distorted conversation uh, about the price. There have been some very fine uh, studies by economists 
that's that demonstrate that we're paying way too much for what we have now. We can't continue with 18% of our gross national product going into the healthcare industry. We need to um, um, limit or actually make it more efficient, I should say. It actually is going to probably be a lot more <laughs> after COVID. But um, because, because we're in this situation right now, we need to um, take it on as a, as a single payer, one checkbook, so that we can um, get better control of our expenditures and make them more useful for us as individuals and cut out the fat of the profiteering. But the profiteers don't want to leave. And as long as they're in the, in the arena, they're going to continue to distort and um, uh, propagandize to a certain degree their position and leave all of us citizens fearful that uh, we, can't, we can't change. And they have the advantage because human beings generally have a uh, reluctance to change. Aversion, uh, yes. A loss aversion. And, you know, when social scientists study this phenomenon in, in our human spirit, they find that it takes the view that something has to look twice as good as what we, as what we think we have before <laughs> we take, take the step. Right. Uh, burden, burden a hand is worth two in the bush, you know? Yeah. Uh, but because of that psychological effect of human nature, it's really easy to fear monger and to distort the conversation and to make it very difficult to, uh, to um, argue or to, to con converse in public, uh, public arena about this very, very major problem. Well, Mark, the COVID-19 pandemic, which nobody knows how it's going to play out or how long it's going to play out, does it take us closer to the Medicare for all system that, that you'd like to see enacted? Well, I haven't seen it doing it yet. Um, it's certainly exposing a lot of the problems that we have with our current system because it's a, it's a uh, um, patchwork of uh, delivery. Um, it's not coordinated and um, sort of, um, what can I say, um, uncoordinated uh, financing and, 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 and um, interventions for our communal health. Okay. Um, and so, but you ask, you know, are we getting closer? I think we're getting closer in the sense that it, we're showing a lot of the deficiencies of our current system. Yeah, I would hope that people okay. can. Well, I was I was intrigued, as you know, the U.S. Supreme uh, U.S. Supreme Court just agreed to take another look at whether Obamacare is legal. If if the court threw that out. I think you would be recommending going to the Medicare for all. I don't know if that's political fe politically feasible, but what are your concerns if the Supreme Court did throw out Obamacare? Well, it would be even more chaotic than it is now for some period of time until our legislators and policymakers could get a handle on the circumstance. The um, Accountable Care Act was an effort to spread the health insurance to more people. Uh, I think maybe the dream would have been to make universal health insurance available to all, well, citizens in our country. Uh, it failed on that front, it, but it did it did expand it a little bit um, to some to some um, segments of the population that have been excluded in the past. Well, when we if we um, withdrew that piece of legislation and all of the other the many other aspects that. Uh, would regulate what health insurers have to do. Uh, in other words, they have to limit their um, their their profit. I mean, their uh, medical loss ratio. You know, they to less than fifteen percent. All of those things are big parts of the Accountable Care Act that would be gone, and so there would be a period of chaos. Uh, and eventually, we would have to have another. Um, replacement for it, uh, you know, maybe the legislators would try to put that one back in after trimming off some things that they think make it uh, ineligible by a Supreme Court decision. But um, it's it's all it's not a it's not a full solution. It's just part way there. And okay. so I continue to advocate for going where we need to end up. For for decades, people have asked me how you know because I'm a doctor, I'm in the field. Do you think we're ever going to get to universal care? And I I have felt you know, since the 80s, that yes, we'll get there. It's uh, inevitable. And people would say, well, how's he, how do you believe it's inevitable? And say, because other developed economies have solved this problem. And so we will too. It's just that we're making it very painful 
in the process of trying to get there. Should Congress and the president enact another uh, third or fourth COVID-19 relief package? And if so, does it does the debate about increasing our, na- our federal debt, uh, should that be part of the debate over whether we need another relief package, Mark? You know, we will need more um, support um, from, from our fin- uh, federal government to help us get through this uh, COVID pandemic. I think uh, Americans are little by little appreciating that it's not gonna be just a month or two, but we're in for a much longer time. Uh, I wish that as we go forward supporting our economy and supporting citizens that we see how important it is to make investment, make uh, resources available to the base, um, to small business, and even more to local governments, uh, states and counties, because that's where really important decisions are being made and that's where um, good interventions are happening. And because we're such a wide, big country, you can't make these kinds of um, what they call granular decisions on a national scale, but we can support the local government from a national basis. And so then I think that's where we need to redirect um, support from the federal government in order to uh, provide grants as needed for states and counties to make the necessary intervention that's going to go on for months and possibly even years. And then you asked, what about deficit spending? I don't think there's any problem with deficit spending. We don't stop to think about that when we're in World War II or World War I. We, you know, if you're, if you're in a war, uh, it's a national emergency as we're in, and you have to make expenditures to meet the emergency. Uh, people would say, well, what happens with inflation? We don't have inflation uh, under these circumstances. We did it during the Second World War when we were making huge expenditures. Um, but if, uh, if that does become a problem, then you can uh, slow that down on the backside by um, increasing your taxes, which, need, which I believe will need to be happen, uh, actually for other reasons. Um, and that's, that's the way to slow down uh, inflation if it needs to be happened. But uh, making expenditures at this time is important because that's what we do. We're, we're a community. We're a national community, and we have to support ourselves. And um, the uh, accounting of book on a national level, on a sovereign uh, f- uh, financial system, is not the same as balancing a family's checkbook. It's just a okay. whole different thing. Okay. Um, just one more question on this topic. Senate Majority Leader McConnell has said that uh, legal liability for health care providers and businesses who act in good faith and uh, who meet the CDC standards for health and safety, they should be immune from uh, lawsuits. Uh, do you uh, agree with that? You know, I don't know why, why he's worried about that. It makes me suspicious. I mean, when we do what we are supposed to do as professionals. Um, Why are we worried about um, somebody bringing a lawsuit? I'm not sure where that's coming from or where that's going. Um, As a practicing physician, I'm aware of what it's, you know, when my colleagues or other people I would know would would have a lawsuit brought against them, how devastating it is for, you know, um, unexpected uh, outcome to treatment. But it's a necessary part of healing wounds. You know, if something fails, then we have methods for trying to uh, reconcile and heal those wounds. And to say that somebody is immune uh, just doesn't make sense. If uh, if our physicians, and I'm sure they will be, physicians that I know will do their very best. And it, I don't know where this concern for um, lawsuits comes from. Okay, let's move on to other issues. The Supreme Court ruled that the president may be able to end DACA, but he didn't do it the right way. Um, What do you think should be the future of DACA? Oh, definitely there has to be a way for um, the the people who have received DACA protection to become citizens. It's just obvious to me that um, young people coming into this country you know, this is this is their country. They have no other um, appreciation of their community other than an American community. 
but I believe much more than that, that we are scapegoating a lot of people who come to this country as immigrants, um, that we are scapegoating and making them the whipping boy for things that they have really no responsibility for. Mm -hmm. um, our country is built on immigration and immigrants coming to this country to seek the American dream. And the, the, that energy that people bring with them when they immigrate to our country yeah. for the last 250 years has been the most important resource for who we are today. And to put and to compromise that with a lot of gibberish about illegal entry and so forth is just shooting ourselves in the back. Yeah. Uh, we need to welcome people in and integrate into our country because that that's not a burden. That is actually a blossoming and a resource for the future of our country. And given our climate emergency that we have worldwide, we will see more and more immigration, large immigration, or large migrations of people around the world. So this issue of national borders and what they're going to mean in the face of billions of people over the next uh, four or five decades being uh, displaced from where, they're, where they were living, uh, needing to find other place to live. They're not going to just stay in a place that's too hot for them to survive. They're going to move. And so it, it becomes an international problem that the United States should be a leader and not somebody looking like, um, you know, has no idea what it, should, what it can do for uh, managing uh, people crossing borders. Well, you mentioned the term climate emergency. Uh, let's, let's use the more traditional climate change. Next steps this nation should take on climate change, Mark? Um, we need to um, take leadership in the 195 so uh, nations um, in the world. We have the strongest economy and um, other nations look to us for that leadership role. And that's what we need to do. Now on a local basis, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are, um, um, included in the Green New Deal, for example, of how our economy can become green, how we can get off of fossil fuel, which is an imperative. We have to get off fossil fuel, uh, transition to um, renewable energy sources. All of that's obvious. But way more important in my mind is the importance of our country taking a leadership role because this is a global um, problem. It's a humanity problem. And and somebody has to take it in all of us have to take it into uh, control and management. We're beyond being able to go back. It's an issue now of mitigating the, the risks that have already started and the, the more that will happen. And um, that management has to be done globally. And the United States has a very important part to play in the next you know 50 years, 100 actually centuries, as uh, the climate uh, alterations that have already started are going to continue to play out even if we could go to zero carbon emission today, it's already going to keep going because of, um, well, for a multitude of things, I get into them. <laughs> Understand. Um, Americans know a lot more than two months ago about how some police treat uh, uh, suspects in their custody. The, uh, the House has passed a police reform bill. Uh, Republican Senator Tim Scott, the only uh, African-American Republican, has worked on a bill do we need national standards saying no chokeholds, no no uh, uh, knock warrants, things like that? What elements would be in a police reform bill that that, that you could vote for? Um, I think that national standards are good, but the thrust should be in the direction of supporting local governance. Um, holding all professions up to a certain standard is important, and that changes with time. You know, I, as a physician, had to always uh, maintain my skill set up to a, a standard. And that was just the minimum. But, you know, we expect more from professionals. And so the same thing for our police officers. The community police officers uh, learn a skill set, but it's not the same uh, as a physician. What I learned as a resident was way behind what I did, what I continue to learn over 30 years, 35 years of practice. And so I can imagine the same thing goes on with any profession, like our community um, law enforcement. And so I think that on a national level, we can we should create 
um, sort of minimum standard, so to speak, that um, makes sense to the whole country, but to also advocate for um, ever improving standards in all regions and all subregions and all communities. And we do that again through a lot of times through grants saying, if you meet these standards, you receive this, these uh, financial supports. And I think that mechanism is a very good one. Okay. Um, do we need to raise the federal minimum, minimum wage, Mark? Yes. Uh, to, uh, how high? Oh gosh, you know, $15 gets touted, but that's been the same one we've been touting for the last five, 10, 10 years. Okay. Um, we haven't had that much inflation, but the problem with not having one is that we're starving our own economy. Our economy works on the multitude of exchange that goes on between individuals. And if we want our economy to be strong, we need for people to have that opportunity at all levels to engage in that, those, those continuous thousands of exchanges that we have in the course of a, a day, a week. And if um, a, a person is working a full-time job and they're not able to have a, a life that um, is um, livable, so to speak, the livable wage, then they end up taking a second job just to try to survive. Um, when I lived in Africa for a half dozen years, I came to the realization that the folks I was living with, they were living in mud uh, brick homes, adobe huts, um, you know, grass roots, or grass uh, uh, roofs a lot of times, sometimes they had corrugated steel. And so from our perspective in the United States, we would say, boy, that is extreme poverty. But these folks didn't see themselves as being poor. And I, I asked myself, well, what's the essential? The essential is I need a place of refuge to, you know, for my family to sleep and, and you know, to call my own castle. We need a, uh, a place to live. We need uh, some security for our nutrition. And if we have that, like the folks that I knew in Lukafu in uh, Zaire, Africa, we need time to be able to visit with our friends and family so that we can enjoy what it is to be a human being in a community. And if you have those three things, the other thing you think about is I want my children to have it a little better than what I had. So you're looking for how can I get them an education so that they can do a little better than I did. And if we can do that, then, you know, we're living a human life. We're living, a, we're thriving as a human being. And um, if, if, if you have a $12.50 uh, an hour uh, wage and you're living in a community where you have to pay, you know, $1,000 for your rent, my gosh, you know, how do you find time to, to do what I just described, to waste time with your friends and family and to enjoy what it is to be a human being? Um, and if you don't have um, good uh, nutrition, uh, you know, resource, you know, you live in a food desert, um, you know, with high priced um, hot dogs relative to somebody who lives in, in, a, in a better economic, sub-economic circumstance. So I, I am a strong advocate that it's important to support um, people living, um, you know, on the, the more constrained economic circumstances. You work a full-time job, you should be able to have shelter, you should be able to have a, your food security, and you should be able to have time to waste with your friends and family so that you can live a human life. Ag anchors a big part of the third congressional district. Um, how would you advocate for ag if, if you go to the U.S. House? We need to um, support our family farms. You know, our, you know, what was it that our Secretary of Agriculture said, you know, get, get bigger or get out? That's the exact opposite of what is needed. Our, our small farmers, you know, family farmers, they, they care for the land. They care for their livestock. They, they provide a human... Um, community in the rural areas uh, and all of that's being lost very rapidly so we'll end up with um, des you know deserts between urban centers that are being exploited by um, large uh, KFOs or comp corporation expenditures profits going to stockholders who really have no no concern for the environment where those profits are being drawn so my belief is, to go small, not big, and um, to also move in the direction of local um, nutritional uh, resourcing. So instead of 
you know, purchasing uh, agricultural products from halfway around the world and transporting them here, we, we should exploit the opportunity that we have all around us to take uh, the very wealth of uh, our local farmers and use that, which um, provides a more nutritious source and is certainly more um, energy efficient and uh, good for the economy in many ways. Okay, um, maybe a final question. Uh, you've chosen to uh, run against the Dean of Democrats and the Wisconsin's U.S. House delegation. Uh, he's been raising money for decades. Uh, how are you going to be competitive, both uh, financially and in terms of a camp, uh, in terms of vi- uh, of a viable campaign? So I think Steve, you're asking me what's the difference between myself and the person who's also uh, campaigning for this position to be hired by the people of Western Wisconsin to be their I representative. Am. I am. Yes. And so uh, the, thank you so for, the dis- for for putting my question better than I did. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, I'll describe my impression of um, Representative Kind is that he's very well adapted to what's going on in Washington D.C. We- we have many things go, uh, happening, but one of them is the uh, campaign financing system is such that people with a lot of wealth and a lot of um, po- power in that way have a lot of control over what's happening. And so then um, that system has developed over a long time. And the best solution would be to have publicly funded campaign because campaigns should be an opportunity for the electorate to hire to, to do, um, you know, um, employee uh, interviews to see, do I want to hire this person or not? So it is a public good. And as a public good, it should be supported by uh, uh, by public funding. But because we have just this exab- exaggerated private funding of our campaign financing, we really don't have a job interview. We have more of a hyper-marketing uh, battle who can outmarket the other guy with glitzy um, ads and scare tactics? And but I'm not, you know, I don't want to criticize Mr. Kind for ma- making scare tactics, but he, I think he's very well adapted to the system of gathering lots of money. And he's in a he's on the Ways and Means Committee, so he's a good target for um, special interests to want to influence his decision making. Uh, and also his security of being reelected. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons that I'm in this race is because I believe that system deprives us of the kind of representation that we all want. And that is our representative essentially feels um, uh, able to listen to the electorate and feels that that's my base, that that is how I get uh, get reelected in two years if, if I do a good job. And if if I believe I get reelected in two years by gathering lots of money, well, then I don't spend much time listening to my electorate. When the time comes, my job becomes one of trying to manage their expectations uh, instead of listening. And um, that, that, that's not the, the form of democracy that I hope for for the future and that I, I would like to work for with whatever years I have left in my life to hand off to my son and to those who will follow. I understand. Thank you very much. Mark Newman of La Crosse is a Democratic candidate in the 3rd Congressional District. The primary is August 11. Mark, thank you so much for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association Quick Trip Wisconsin Counties Association Wisconsin Realtors Association and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139